This week on Erotic Awakening, post-transition, single-user power exchange. Welcome to Erotic Awakening, an exploration of all things erotic. If you are offended by adult topics or prohibited by law, we recommend you stop listening <laughs> right now. This week, Patreon supporters receive bonus content, including an audio recording on navigating power exchange and polyamory, as well as early access to the podcast, a free version of the audiobook Polyamory Toolkit, free ebooks, exclusive chat. We have a great one too. And member only Discord access and other things. For as little as five dollars a month, you can support the show and get on an ever expanding list of bonus content. Head over to patreon.com slash erotic awakening. And thank you today. to our latest supporters, Hypno Story and Panda oh, that's awesome. and Dawn. And I just got oh, to meet yeah. Hypno Story and Panda in person finally, not too long ago. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Who a... got to? I didn't get to. Oh, no, you were there. No, I wasn't. Sleep. Okay, no, that's not, not working. Yet. Not yet. But on. I did. Today on the podcast, super interesting show. Really looking forward to having this conversation. And I'm not going to start it pre, before, I'm not going to start it before we actually bring our guest on. We'd ask Lee Harrington to join us on the podcast today. Lee, come on in and we will get started. And there you are. <laughs> Hi, Lee. Hi. It's such a delight to be back on the show. It is always so heartwarming to see you as well as be part of Erotic Awakening. It was such a transformative experience within my life. And every time we get to reconnect, it feels like waves of new chapters of existence. Yes. Totally agree. And I would love to have a situation where we are uh, stuck in the desert or something where we're not in the middle of actually doing something and we could just chill and hang out for a little bit. Between you, between us, we managed to stay a little bit busy. So, and you know, the first time we met, we got to have a really good conversation. And I'm actually going to have a question about that in a little bit. But I don't and, know that and, I want to start that's, with that. And that's his word. <laughs> well, too bad for you because I want to start with that. <laughs> About how many, how long ago was this, Dawn? I think it was, Lee, you might have to correct me. So I'm 13, thinking Dark Odyssey. 15. And I'm thinking about 04, 05. It, there would have been a yeah. theater ritual with Raven and Joshua in the big barn. Oh my God. Just... And that was the, the <laughs> yeah. descent of Anana. I think it was that event. Yeah. And I'm thinking 04, 05, 06, that far back. And and the big I'm thing that I question. take away, the big thing I take away from that is Dawn and I were sitting and talking with you, and I think there may have been one other person with us, but mm -hmm, there was. we were having this conversation, and over in the dungeon nearby, there was a couple getting it on, and they were getting loud and crazy and having a good old time. And I remember thinking, I wish that they would get done because I'm sitting here having a great conversation. Instead of, hey, I can't sit here and have a conversation. I got to go see what the hell kinky shit's going on over there. See, and what oh I gosh. remember is the beautiful dress that you were wearing. So that night. I, I don't recall the dress. I do. <laughs> but the point in this podcast, the point in this episode. Yeah, for... Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> right. Well, and for folks who aren't familiar with it, the Descent of Anana is a classical mythological experience out of Mesopotamian and Babylonian myth lore and religion. And this ritual was an immersive experience where people took on different roles from that mythology, from that religion. And instead of it being just a storytelling, it was, oh, the goddess Inanna was beaten on her way into the underworld. We beat her, yep. right? Instead of it just being a storytelling piece, it was this thing and it was so beautiful and if folks are not familiar with the book dark moon rising pagan bdsm and the ordeal path the basic script and you want to look into this the basic script for that ritual was in there mm -hmm. yeah the the thing that was interesting about that conversation we had was we had it with with a different you completely the pre-transition bridget harrington who we originally met you as and so it's been five, ten. What did we decide? Fifteen years. How long has it been? I think it was two thousand five. 
Okay. So that's a complex question for transgender people because okay. my medical transition where I started pursuing looking for doctors, where I started looking for medical interventions for my body, that was the end of 2006. And then I started having, I had my first surgery specific to transgender experience in 2007. But really, it, that's a complex topic because I tried to transition back when I was a teenager and I was turned down because of my sexual orientation. Because back in the 90s, you had to become a, quote, normal member of society. And I was bisexual. I was never going to look like a heterosexual individual who could pass in society in that way. And so the question of, like, when did you transition? Oh, 2007 is when I started legally transitioning, right? I changed the net, the letters on my, my state ID. A year later, I changed it on my passport. Like, where do you count something as real? It's so, it, it's a really amorphous concept. Is it when you tell your friends? Is it when you tell your mother? Right? And so... That notion of when did I socially transition? When did I tell people I'm going to start going by the name Lee? I am somebody who walks in the world as a man. I am somebody who is gender queer, but this is how I want to operate in my day to day life. That's end of 2006. Okay. So it would have been 2004 that we met you. So it was either 2004 or 2005. Yeah. So I have another question for you because I know we want to talk more about the transition itself and the things that have changed for you. So my big, is it a big question? It, it may not be. So here I go stumbling with it again. So like we said, we met you with a different name at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So how important is it to you that we not refer to that name? I mean, is it okay to tell stories using that name? Because I don't want to say like the before and the after, because that sounds very binary, right? This is something that's that's either happened over time or was always. So how important is it that we do or do not use that name? How important is it to you? Yeah. So there's a term in the trans community called dead naming. The idea that that former part of yourself is dead. Well, for me, I use the concept of a former name in the same way that I have friends of mine who were married for a while and took on someone's last name. And after the divorce, they really don't want referred to with that last name because it was a nasty breakup or whatever it might have been. And so it's really uncomfortable if you use that last name referring to them, but it was also legally and even socially true. So that's kind of parallel I use is a, I don't want to be referred to that name anymore. Not, not free for me. It feels a little weird, but if someone does, it's the same as referring to someone by their former l l last name. Okay. Okay, cool. Because I, I I get confused because like my memories of you are with that name at the beginning. So it's like, okay, but yeah, Lee Lee I wasn't guess. using the name Lee then. So how do I even refer to that piece of history? And is it even important? It is important. <laughs> And, and that actually leads to, you know, we don't want to, regardless of how many books I've read, how many conversations you and I have, I will never truly understand the experience of being a trans person, right? Just like I can't understand the experience of being a Chinese person, right? Or a menopausal woman. Or a menopausal <laughs> woman, right? So what do you want non-trans people to know? Right. And the term that I love for non-transgender people is this gender. And that's the Latin word for same. Because trans is, is opposite, right? Transatlantic. 
it means same. So it's that concept. Because if you say not trans people, it's kind of like saying white people and not white people. Okay. Okay. Right? Like it no, feels no, really it's got that, Yeah, it's got that weird feeling. Yeah. Yeah, or it's not, it's not that it's not true. There's just something where my shoulders go up and go, that feels weird. Okay. For me with cisgender people, I'm a big fan of finding parallels in someone's life. Okay. So an example that when we think about surgical procedures, I have a friend of mine who had gone through gastric bypass surgery. And I said, well, when you're wearing clothes and seen in the world at large, do you feel more you? And they said, yeah, I absolutely do. This is what I expect me to look like. This is how I feel healthy. And I said, but sometimes when you take off your clothing, does it still feel a little weird? And they're like, yeah, it's still got skin bags. I haven't had anything to change that up. And even where I have, my breasts aren't quite where they were before. It just feels a little off. And I'm like, kind of similar for me mm -hmm. where, yeah, I've done stuff surgically and I've done stuff with, with hormones and I can present my legal identification and be seen as who I am. And that's great. And as a note, you don't have to do that stuff to be the gender that you are, right? It, that's not necessary. But, but I chose that path. And I said, but at the same time, when I take off my clothes, or especially if I take off my clothes and then someone responds to me, say at an orgy, and they go, oh, that's not the body I expected, right? Suddenly it's like, oh, that's, I feel a little off, either with myself or with that person. And so for her, talking to her about her gastric bypass surgery, suddenly she and I had something in common to talk about. Mm -hmm. Or I have another friend of mine where he's a cisgender man, but he had gynomastia, right? Where he had a lot of chest tissue. And for him, he ended up having a surgical procedure and to have that taken down, but it didn't go the way he wanted to, and he doesn't have nipple sensation anymore. Hmm. He's a cisgender man, right? He was born, he was assigned male at birth. He grew up a boy. He is a man. And he's, you know, but he still had a medical comparison to me to go, oh, dude, I get it. And suddenly we were two guys talking about how surgeons can fuck up. <laughs> Not, it wasn't suddenly a trans person and a cis person having a conversation. It was two people right. having a conversation about how the medical industry sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm so curious from a you personal perspective, you being in your body, what's it, what surprises have you come across in presenting mail that you didn't expect? Oh, in presenting mail, I throw a couple of them out. One, it is profoundly depressing to have women cross the street to get away from me. Mm. Wow. I feel so much for every man I've, I've ever met now who have that feeling of having some woman be scared, looking over their shoulder at you or at me and being like, ah, oh, and crossing the street or walking faster because of some bad apple who did something horrible to that woman or that woman's siblings or mother or whatever. Mm -hmm. That sucks. I'd say the second one that was really surprising was understanding the culture of men's bathrooms. Where it's like, oh, in women's restrooms, if you're out of toilet paper, you just say, hey, does someone have toilet paper? <laughs> and then someone hands you toilet paper. In men's rooms, if you say anything, suddenly I was a dude that couldn't say anything because men don't say things yes. in men's restrooms most of the time. Unless you're we don't kid. do that here. <laughs> we don't do that here. We're supposed to keep your head down, not interact with everyone. Go, Yeah. So that was really surprising for me, like in walking now in a man in the world. Um, the next is that my orientation, my sexual orientation 
changed the way my gender was understood. And so if, like, I oftentimes get read as gay before I get read as being a man. Okay. Oh. Right. Not, I mean, not all the time, but there's often times where, like, like, I think of my, a friend of mine years ago trying to teach me dude lessons. Right, that if you're going to be a real man, you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z. The first lesson was you have to be able to put everything in your pockets for going to a sports game. <laughs> right, cultural required. And we, he was trying to teach me how a man walks. And I'm trying to do this thing because there's a part of me that wanted to be seen as the man that I am. And I'm trying to do the thing. I'm trying to do the thing. And then a friend across the room said, you understand that Lee is queer, right? And suddenly the friend who was trying to give me the dude lesson went, oh, never mind. You don't count as a guy then in that way. Like suddenly it's, this concept of what is manhood got yeah. reshelved because of one trait. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like, have you? You had to have seen the movie Birdcage. And they're trying to teach, and I cannot think of the actor's name, but they're trying to teach him how to walk like a man. Or on Too Wong Fu, where they're trying to teach them how to walk like a woman. And it's like, right. Yeah. Huh. What do you, so from the other perspective, is there anything that you miss from being like a female presenting person? I miss being able to talk to strangers' children. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, random men who are not accompanied by a woman and or are already seen as having their own children with them don't have that permission in society. I miss that. I miss the varieties of fashion that are available to women as compared to men. That's expanded in the last decade. But like I suddenly understood when I when I medically transitioned I, more than that when I was seen mm -hmm. and read as the guy that I am, like I suddenly understood why guys get obsessed about different brands of shoes, <laughs> or like the different types of jeans and cuts of things. It's because the amount you can choose from is here, and so your opportunities for self expression become a much more focused concept. So yeah, I miss fashion in in those ways that. I still use those fashion points, but like it, I am making risk points. Like literally in the United States, I am risking murder, right? Making some fashion choices. Other things I miss and miss a swinger community <laughs> because sexual women are cool. Bisexual men all are seen as problematic or we don't know how to process this information. Most swinger communities, again, not everywhere. And then you put transgender men into that mix and suddenly it's like, I have a body shape that people aren't sure how to interact with. The flip side is I gained the gay men's bathhouse community and sex community. So, and then I'd say for the fourth thing that I'd miss, I would put on there the notion of women's spaces in general. So like, being able to go to a women's spa or a women's workout space because men's only workout spaces tend to have a lot more competitive edge to them. Mm -hmm. And men's like saunas and whatnot, just like, like the whole like go to the bathroom, keep your head down thing. It's a different cultural thing that actually has community to it. And not that all women get you know, that out of women's spaces, but there is a loss for me out of the social experience that can happen in the world of exercise, workout, and body care. So even with the, the differences and the challenges and the things that you miss or the things that you don't feel you can do now, overall, are you happy? Are you happy with having made the choice to do the medical transition?
So choice is a tricky word for me because for a lot of transgender people, your choices are potentiality of suicide Mm. or do the thing. Okay. Or the notion of health and well-being, even if it's not that expansive, right? Even if it's not, not that big. And... Yeah, I, even though I was turned about teenager, I spent 10 years trying to figure out what life could be as a woman. And finally, at 26, had a mental health adventure where I realized I just couldn't do this anymore. Like, it wasn't an option. That even if I was genderqueer, having it be big-breasted, big-butted, porn actress, that that couldn't be how my day-to-day existence functioned. And so am I glad I did it? Yeah, because the other option wasn't good. And am I glad I did it because I fit in gay men's leather spaces? And is it right? Because I am able to express so much of my identity in a way that I wouldn't have been able to otherwise. Absolutely. And is it important? Perfect. Yeah. And anyone who tells you that you're going to transition and the world is all going to be better, I don't, it's not real. In the same way that if somebody says, oh, you can lose all of this weight and it will take care of your depression. No, you're going to also have depression that right. also needs care and maintenance and love. And so for me, having, my, having a medical transition was one thing in a step towards my health and well-being and i am grateful for that very cool awesome awesome all right one more question for you if you don't mind on this and this is one more question for this podcast right because we have thousands of questions for you if you could go back and revisit life as bridget for a day is there something you would say oh i wish i'd done this before at that time with that body, at that, with that outlook on life. I would say that it would be to go and watch the nuance of something like a flower field or birds or something like that. Because I had a weird thing happen. I don't know if this is for all trans men, or all men in general, but I lost some of my, like I, I developed a, set, a much more keen attention to one thing at a time and lost some of my, my bigger, my bigger picture stuff. Mind you, I also gained a more keen, like flavor awareness when it comes to things like vinegars. And so like, who knows, right? Who knows? Bodies are weird. So I would say that or... Yeah, we'll go with that. Well, hopefully, Lee, we've given you some non-standard questions, things that you don't normally hear, and we very much appreciate you being open to having the conversation. And I appreciate you pointing out, reminding me that the correct term of cis versus non-trans, it's always valuable for people to be willing to, oh, by the way, don't forget about that, and do so in a compassionate manner. I very much appreciate that. Hang out with us for a little bit while we wipe this thing, wrap this thing up. Rack this thing up? Is that Rack what it said? Thing is what you said. No, I don't know. <laughs> Lee, it's amazing that I don't run into you more often because we're going to be in Toronto, Texas, Pennsylvania, Detroit, Kansas City, Chicago, Tulsa, Minnesota. Before the end of the year and in our new little house. But anyway, keep up with all of our events, book news and discounts and more via the Erotic Awakening newsletter. And get your EA shout out like Katie in Illinois. And Susan in Missouri. Speaking of people that shout outs and such, we actually had a patron reach out recently asking this question. And Lee, I'm really curious about your opinion on this as well. Can someone without a leader still fulfill their needs as a follower or do you have to have a person and or people? Can you, I guess, so I take that question. I mean, can I be a follower or whatever, submissive, slave, whatever term you want to use? even if I don't have a leader in my life. Actually, over on my Patreon, I have an hour and a half recording on exactly this topic for folks who are at the level. So if folks are interested in that, but my short answer is 
you absolutely can. You absolutely can. And there's some great resources out there. Is it the Self Colored Club? I want to say that's the Instagram group, the Self Colored Club. Uh, and yeah, I've got a whole bunch over on my website, which, which is passionandsoul.com or the same for Patreon. But yeah, I'm a big believer that we can serve ourselves. We can serve our community. We can serve our connection to a higher power. We can serve in a way of practicing for a future person. We can serve a vision. There are so many ways we can serve or follow. There, we've actually got a couple of uncollared submissives here in the Columbus, Ohio area that have coined the term that they are free range submissives <laughs> and they have figured out. I mean, they have they, like one of them has actually decided they don't want a leader. They know there's a submissive. They know they're a follower, but they have found other ways besides serving a single person to fulfill what it is that they need in their life. So. Yes, I absolutely believe that. But I think sometimes it depends if you look at, it's kind of like polyamory, right? So polyamory is like, is it a lifestyle choi choice or is it how you're wired? And I think sometimes being a follower is like that too. Is it a pink that turns you on sometimes or is it how you're wired and what you need, right? So, and and I think especially with the is it what you need and who you are that you can absolutely because it's who you are i'm gonna say yes but <laughs> it is like can i be polyamorous if i don't have any other partners why yes you can is it a completely different animal it's a different experience mm -hmm. yes it is i'm gonna put that link to the patron stuff that you said in, in our show notes Lee, so i can go take a look at it because i'm not that is convinced. I'm not, I, I totally agree with what you're saying that you can serve yourself, serve the community, serve your higher power. But is that, isn't, is the power exchange dynamic dependent on the exchange aspect of it, the giving and the taking, the power back and forth? And I kind of lean towards that it is. So I better go research that some because I don't want to, I don't want to argue with the two of you, to be honest. <laughs> it just doesn't feel like a good idea for me. <laughs> Right. And it makes me think also of, was it Joshua Tenpenny's book, Real Service? I think it was that he argued that, that there are people who are in service because it is about interaction, right? It's a two-way street. And other people who are, because they want to serve that one person and they don't require energy back, right? It's the mm -hmm. rock star kind of energy thing going on. And I think... For a solitary person or a free range person, I love that term. <laughs> For a free range person, being in service in some way, but you don't have a person. Well, if, you, if you're not format number one, if you are format number one, I think that's a different topic. But when you talk about yes and or yes but, I, I think it goes into that question too: is how how are you aligned? in the concept of following. Like, what are you following and, and why, right? What's your why? What's your why? Exactly. Perfect, yeah. 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 I, I'm down for that one, 100%. So we're gonna throw that question of the day out on our Discord again we as are. well to see if we can get some interaction on our Discord channel. We usually get a lot. And if, you're out there on the, if you're out there on the Discord, you can find that question of the day. And if you don't know what Discord is, I barely know what it is myself, but I put links out there on the Erotic Awakening website. So, and like I said, there's good conversation. We've got a good group of people on there. We do indeed. And, and these people like to send me pictures of tentacles still. We've been doing this for so many years. I have so many pictures of tentacles and stuff and, you know, they're coming in. So, and Sam Wall sent me an animated gift from Reddit of all places of a girl reading a book and cooking and the tentacles coming up and, and tickling her delightfully. I, I don't understand why you said of Red, from Reddit of all places. Reddit is the hub of interesting kinks. I, you know what? I've got, you've set me up, I don't know how many times with links and I, and I still forget it's out there. Ghost nipples, man. Ghost nipples. Oh yeah, I remember that. So 
And then Minotaurus, it's a little tin sign with an octopus on it in a bathtub. And it says, what is it? Getting naked? Oh, let's get naked unless you're just here for a visit. Don't make it weird. Okay. I, I want that in the new RV. I think that would be cool. So, and then Basanos sent the mechanical octopus with the different motors on each leg. So that was kind of cool. It's like life size. And then Trevere with the octopus, all this beautiful art of the octopus wrapped around the woman. And and these people know what makes my heart go thump. My well. fetish, uh, <laughs> apparently my fetish of food on boobs is not nearly as popular as tentacles. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and it's funny because when you said when you said tentacles, at first I heard tentacles. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, people said photographs of pentacles. That makes sense. And maybe it's just because I've been doing a lot today around the Parliament, International Parliament of World Religions. And if folks are not familiar with it and you are a spiritual person of any faith background, it happens once every four years at different places all over the globe. But it happens to be in Chicago, Illinois this year for the folks who are in the United States. And there's an entire, I've been working with the folks that are part of the Pagan track. And it's an amazing lineup. We've got like the lineup, I think every single time slot for the grid, not for the pagan, but just in general, every time slot has 25 to 30 classes. Yeah. Like that's how big the event is. It's like 10,000 people. Wow. It's massive. So, and so I think pentacles are just on my brain because of that. I'm going to be on a panel on masculinities within goddess-based religions. So, yeah, it should be really interesting to, to look at, to have that panel experience. I'm going to have to look into that. So keep trying to figure out how to up my, my game on my, my spiritual path. So that would be awesome. That would be another conversation we could easily have. <laughs> Instead, I will have this conversation. Take a moment to support the podcast. Read us an Apple, Apple pod. I'll do this again. Take a moment to support the podcast with podcast, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Or just tell your friends. Feel free to reach out to us. We love interacting with you. Contact us with questions, podcast comments, or just to say hi. You can find us on FetLife as Dana Dawn. We are Erotic Awakening on Instagram. You can use links on our important website for Facebook and Discord. Which we just got into. Well, oh, don't tell anybody. I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to tell anybody yet. Or just email us at Dan and Dawn at eroticawakening.com. Bye, Dawn. Bye, Dan. Bye, Reed. Bye.